looks like we got quite a few states represented here. I'm seeing a lot of different parts of the country chiming in. Give it just another second. All right. I think they're starting to slow down a little bit, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And we've got a little bit of introductory information to share. So as the number of participants um, might might continue to climb just a little bit, hopefully we, we have most everybody on and can get started. But welcome again, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us today for excuse me, with us for today's webinar on safety and workplace wellness for licensors. Um, this is a topic that's been requested a number of different times from participants during prior webinars when we've asked about what types of sessions would be helpful. Uh, so we were really excited to be able to offer this today. Some of you may be aware of the executive order that was issued by the White House fairly recently. It's related to opportunities to support the mental health and well-being of the early education, um, excuse me, early care and education workforce. And one notable component of the order is to focus on the implementation of strategies to expand mental health support for the care workforce, including early childhood providers supported through CCDF and Head Start. Um, we wholeheartedly believe that child care licensing is the vital foundation to a sound early childhood system, and many components of integrated early care systems would not exist without child care licensing. So extending the support for the well-being to licensing staff certainly seems to be of value, and we're really grateful to have you here with us today. Um, as we look ahead, we're going to take a look at the agenda for today's webinar. And you can see here that we um, have a, a variety of different topics related to mental health, well-being, and um, safety as it relates to licensing. Um, I won't read the list of the agenda items to you, but do have just a couple of notations. One quick housekeeping note is that since we are a very large group of attendees and we are in webinar mode, we won't have the capability for participants to unmute, um, but we really do want you to be interactive throughout using the chat function. And then we are also going to have some polls um, throughout the presentation. As we get to those, one technical note is that if they don't automatically launch for you or pop up, it may be because you're running an older version of Zoom, um, but not to worry because you can feel free to put your response in the chat box. Um, along the bottom part of your toolbar, you should see an option for chat that you can use for that. Many of you have already used it to, to say hello and let us know where you're from, so that's great. Um, one other um, piece of housekeeping is that the slide deck and the recording from today's session will be available on our website once the video and the document have gone through the accessibility remediation process. And so um, that will be available there, or if you have colleagues that missed today's session and want to listen back to it, the recording will be there also. And then for participants that attend today's live session, um, for the full time, you will receive a certificate via email for attending. And so I'll talk a little bit about, more about that at the um, end of the session. If by chance you experience any audio or technical difficulties during the session, um, the first you know thing to, to try that's usually most helpful is just to try to log out and log back in to see if that resolves your issue. You can send a chat again since we have such a large um, attendee list today, it may be hard, you know, to do, to do that, but we'll work with you as best we can to hopefully get your audio or things back. Um, sometimes it's just a connectivity issue. I know there um, many times with Zoom, if you have too many things running in the background, in addition to Zoom, that can kind of take some of the bandwidth. So you might want to try that if you're having any, you know, low connectivity issues. Um, so now I want to just take a brief moment to introduce you to our team for today. My name is Amy Page, and um, I am with the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance, 
and have been with the center a little over two years. And prior to that was with one of our partner TA centers here at the federal level. I have uh, quite a bit of um, experience and time at the state level in child care licensing, first as a frontline licensing staff, as well as a manager, and then also within policy. And um, really excited to have with us today, um, Erica, Kelly, Erica, take a moment to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Kelly, and I'm super excited to be here with my two colleagues. Uh, I have been with ECQA. It's approaching a year now. Prior to joining the team, I was at a state education agency, and I was overseeing our governor-appointed Early Childhood Advisory Council. I was also responsible for leading our healing-centered engagement activities. And so a lot of my experience does come from working in the mental health field, looking at trauma-informed care and the intersections of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I'll pass it to Tracy. Great, thanks, Erica. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tracy Chestnut. I'm also an early childhood quality assurance consultant with the Quality Center. I have over 32 years of experience in early childhood education. Prior to joining ECQA just this year, I worked in child care at the state level for 23 years. For nine of those years, I was a licensing specialist, so I was inspecting child care programs and large family child care homes. I think that was one of the most fun but most challenging jobs in my career. I also have eight years experience as a child care center director, so I've been on the receiving end of regulatory compliance also. I'm really excited to be here today to support the important work that you all do every day. So I'm glad you're here. Amy? Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Erica. And I'd be remiss to not mention um, one of our behind the scenes support. ASAF Alexander is on the call today helping us with uh, technical support, and we appreciate his assistance. And so I'm going to look ahead, just going to do a quick icebreaker to allow everybody to kind of warm up if you haven't already using the chat. So what you see here on the screen is just a, a you, you actually don't even have to put in your name because your your chat itself will tell us your name. But if you want to list your agency or what state you're from and then take a moment to just think about what type of mathematical formula could you come up with to express something, you know, or believe. And there's an example there. A long Saturday run plus a frappuccino equals happiness. So just take a moment if you want. You can um, put your thoughts in on that. If you want to just let us know where you're from, that's great, too. Either way, give everybody a moment. A lot of folks to enter information. I saw a campfire with family, and I think it was maybe coffee. Uh, went by fast. Let me see. There's one coffee plus silence equals happiness. And then there was one uh, camping with family and coffee by the campfire equals happiness. Great. Good ones. Awesome. Looks like everybody's got a good grasp on the on the chat. One boat went by real fast about puppies. Puppies are always happening. Oh, beach plus walking your puppies relaxing. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thanks for sharing. This is just a fun little icebreaker you can think of if you're, you know, it's a lot of fun with small groups because you can have people expand on that. But appreciate everybody taking a moment to just tell us where you're from. And um, one thing you will note too is with the chat, um, if you have a behind the scenes question that you want to just ask of the host or panelist, you can change that down in the two. Um, otherwise you can just you know note your chat to everyone if you want to share with the whole group. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move ahead and talk just briefly about today's objectives. We really hope that today's session will prompt discussions and provide food for thought on, you know, how your licensing administrations can approach or strengthen workplace wellness and safety. It's not a topic that's very commonplace across child care licensing. Um, we're going to talk about the impact of stress on our work and how it factors into our daily interactions. We'll also provide some ideas of way you can, ways you can lessen stress and touch on how to effectively handle communications, both internally and with providers. There are not a lot of resources that are readily available on this topic that are written specifically for child care licensing. So our goal is for you to be able to take a nugget of information from today's session that you can effectively apply to your work. Um, and with that, let's get started. 
I'm going to kick us off by talking a little bit about the topic of safety. Um, we have found through our work with states, territories, and tribes that many times, like I said, that this is not a topic that is routinely part of the onboarding process to a great extent for licensors. More often, safety is addressed on a case-by-case -case basis or on an as-needed basis. And so we just want a little to provide some information for consideration today. And the first thing that we're going to look at are just some principles of what are referred to as a healthy safety culture. Um, there is a nationwide uh, center. It's called the Capacity Building Center for States. They focus in mainly on supports for child welfare um, agencies, and they have a um, child welfare worker safety guide, which really can fairly easily be applied to licensing work. One thing that is important to consider is that safety has to be an organization-wide effort in order to be done effectively. Um, the resource notes that a successful safety culture balances individual accountability with system accountability and values open communication, feedback, and continuous learning at all levels of the organization. And just want to mention here too, you all will see as we go throughout the sources that we are using, the slide deck also will have all of the resources. So when you have access to it, when it posts to the website, you'll have access to all of these resources that we're referencing throughout the presentation today. Um, one thing that is highlighted within these principles of a healthy safety culture is that um, at the leadership level within agencies, there should be a commitment to several principles in order for an organization to maintain what they refer to as the healthy safety culture. That first principle is for leadership to have a commitment to safety. And that really looks like, you know, leadership supporting frontline staff and supervisors by listening to their perspectives and their concerns. Um, it really being able to create a mentoring cult culture in which more experienced staff mentor junior staff and help maintain a constant watch for organizational weaknesses that might negatively affect safety. A second principle is prioritizing teamwork and open communication based on trust. And that's really demonstrated by the ability to discuss difficulties and practice candidly and at all levels of the organization without any fear of reprisal. It's important to encourage critical thinking by all staff to analyze cases and uncover individual biases that might affair interfere with good decision making. And when I really think about that from the licensing perspective, we all bring our, our experiences and our backgrounds to our licensing work. And so that certainly can easily kind of frame our perspectives. And we might have, um, you know, even unconscious bias that kind of, you know, ties into the professional judgment that we make. And so it's really just being able to have an open communication and trust among colleagues to be able to kind of work through that and recognize that. Um, developing and enforcing a non-punitive approach to event reporting and analysis is a third principle. And that's really going to be where, you know, clear guidelines can be developed that distinguish between reportable non-punitive errors. Um, and that's, you know, that's maybe gauged more from a child welfare aspect, but it also just um, is, is the basis of having a, a system in place agency-wide that allows um, staff to be able to report concerns and and get support for issues that they're that they're having as well as any support that they may need making decisions um you know whether that's in the field or or after the fact during kind of um evaluation or briefing and then the final principle that's noted just talks about there being a commitment to becoming a learning organization. And so that's one of which, you know, all workers, supervisors, and managers are encouraged to learn from one another and making sure that workers have access to training as well as, you know, knowledge that enables them to think critically about the challenges that you, you know, face in the field and the possibilities for resolving them. So really just, you know, um, continuous quality improvement internally and supports and training for staff. Um, so as you can see, a healthy safety culture is one that e emphasizes emotional safety just as much as physical safety, though both are vitally important. And as we look on to the, um, the next slide, 
talks a little bit about the components of safety. And one of the first principles of worker safety is the idea that workers should be able to do their work in environments that are free from different types of threats that could be, you know, um, any type of physical, verbal, or psychological violence, as well as any types of threats. And so making sure that there's a prioritization of safety for all, all staff at every stage in um, another important principle for worker safety and an effective safety culture is a commitment to the prevention of violence and also the risk of violence. And so just taking a preventative approach and a, a risk management approach. And then finally, worker safety also involves, you know, actual physical safety in the office space or the workspace. And so for many of you all that are frontline licensing staff, you're you know, predominant workspace is out in the field. It's out with the providers um, in the spaces that you are monitoring and, and visiting. And so really have to think broadly about the context of what that looks like um, as far as workspace. Um, the elements and practices of a safe workspace, you know, um, when you think about four walls um, would be, you know, having safe, you know, access to easy access to doors and exits, um, alarm systems, different things like that. And then you really got to kind of think a little bit differently about what that looks like, you know, in the field when you're not in a, you know, brick and mortar uh, establishment. Um, and so those types of things would, you know, apply to when we think about the the building safety and things like that, those would certainly apply to your state offices or your headquarters, or maybe if your state or territory has regional offices that you work out of. But bear in mind that, you know, again, for the majority of our, our work for our frontline staff, it's going to be based out on the field. So we need to think about safety practices from that perspective as well. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about physical safety kind of be, before we get more into emotional safety. And um, Tracy's going to drop a link in the chat to a resource that this comes from. She's got it there for everyone. The National Association of Social Workers has a resource that outlines guidelines for social work safety in the workplace. One of the standards um, within that document talks about the use of safety technology. And um, what they mention about that is you really need to make sure that if there's any type of technology that's used for safety purposes, that they are accompanied by very clear protocols and training regarding the limits and the proper usage of it. They point out, of course, that you don't want technology to provide um, staff with a false sense of security. And also, you know, if you are conducting investigations and things like that and using any kind of recording, then obviously the child care providers and the staff, you know, would have to be informed about the use of that technology, particularly if audio and video recording is involved. And one thing to bear in mind, you know, is this is just information that is shared through this National Association, but bear in mind that if you have any internal policies related to specific use around technology that you would, you know, certainly um, defer to the policies and the, the requirements and the rules around your, within your own system. And so they talk a little bit about different types of technology tools that can be considered. Um, it could be internal alert systems that can be activated from panic buttons in offices. It could be internal alert systems that can be um, used from a key fob or a mobile devices, um, mobile safety devices that incorporate GPS and or audio and video recording, and then personal safety devices if there's um, silent panic buttons or an ID um, card holder where maybe you wear your badge that has audio monitoring. So there's a variety of different safety technology that's available. Um, but you would just want to be sure to, um, you know, make sure that it's something that would be um, within the, you know, the um, allowances of, of your state or territory's policies. And then another standard that's addressed is the use of mobile phones. Many of you, especially all of it, you know, everybody has, you know, 
um, at least at least one mobile phone on them at all times. Typically, um, if you work with the state and you have a state issued mobile phone, you might have two that you have on you at most times. Um, and so one of the things that they know is that, you know, um, it, it's great if there are agency issued phones, because that can certainly help reduce the exposure of personal information. But um, in order for a mobile phone to increase safety, you want to bear in mind that obviously you need to keep the mobile phone fully charged, have a battery hand, battery on hand for emergencies, um, you know, keep a phone charger in the car, all of those things that we, um, you know, know that we need to have with us. Um, one thing too that would ex that they pointed out that would explicitly impact frontline licensing staff is being familiar with the limitations of the cell phone coverage area for the the primary areas that you visit. For many of you that have caseloads that are in larger metropolitan areas, that probably won't be a, a big impact because you probably have fairly good cell coverage. But those of you that maybe visit more rural areas that may not have great cell coverage, that may be impacted there. Um, making sure um, from a management and administrator perspective that all staff know how to use, you know, the phone and the features of the phone properly before going into the field. Um, also important to keep emergency contacts on speed dial, um, keep GPS enabled mobile phone applications, you know, activated at all time when in the field. And one of the things that they pointed out that I was um, thought was kind of interesting that I never really thought about before was you could even agree on um, the use of a code or certain words that or phrases that would help field staff convey the nature of any um, danger or threat, you know, to other managers or colleagues, you know, uh, say, for example, you are on a very sensitive um, investigation related to an allegation that's kind of high level and needed to, you know, request help, but couldn't do so in a safe way. Um, a system like that might be something that you could consider for circumstances like that. And then, of course, um, as we know, and most probably all of our state laws require just to use, you know, not to use handheld phones while driving and be sure to follow all applicable laws for your jurisdiction. Um, one of the other physical safety standards that they point out is um, one that I don't think we as child care licensing administrations really spend a lot, a great amount of time on, and that's thinking about risk assessments prior to field visits. Oftentimes, licensors will certainly prep and prepare for their visits by looking at past compliance history and things like that. But I don't know that many of us really ever think about, um, you know, part of our prep being a risk assessment. And so one of the things that they noted is that as, you know, assessments that there are assessments that can be completed and steps that can be taken, to reduce your risk prior to each uh, each field visit that you make. And so um, there's a range of, you know, safety risks that you may encounter when you do go out in the field. And so some things to keep in mind um, for a preliminary risk assessment prior to that is, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. Do you have a complete exact address of where you're visiting? Um, and I noted, uh, Shelby just made a notation in the chat box too, if any states currently have a checklist like that, that would include risk assessments um, from a licensed or safety perspective. That's a great question, Shelby. Hopefully somebody will chime in if they do. Um, that's something to take into consideration if you don't. Um, some of the different things that they have is, you know, Making sure that you do have, if it's a new facility that you're going to, that you have a complete address because you don't want to go into an area and, um, you know, appear, appear lost, put yourself at risk. Um, one of the things, you know, this is going to date me tremendously from back when I was initially in the field, but it was back in the days when I had a printout of MapQuest directions. <laughs> it was, you know, so we literally had printed MapQuest directions and then we, you know, upgraded to the Garmin's that went on the dash and then <laughs> eventually our mobile phones. So, you know, we've come a long way <laughs> with um, what we have available to us technology wise for that, but just making sure, you know, in as much as possible that you know where you're going. Does the area you're going to pose any risk for violence? You know, so thinking about is the visit scheduled at a time of day that is more risky than other times? 
There may very well be times when you are going out on a complaint investigation and you specifically have to go at a certain time of day because the allegation was related to a specific time of day. So think about additional safety factors that have to factor in if that may be the case. Um, are there other factors that may pose a risk of danger? So, you know, checking ahead for weather or disaster conditions. You know, earlier this week, a lot of different parts of the country were hit by some crazy different, you know, weather. So there could be, you know, icy roads, threats of tornadoes, things like that, and being being safe from that perspective. Have any events occurred in the area recently that might increase a risk of a licensure going into the area? Um, like we mentioned earlier, does the area have reduced reception for mobile devices? And then, you know, are there any um, individuals that are in the path to the family child care home or to the center um, near the location of the visit that present any kind of risk? Thinking about to the assessment of the child care facility or maybe the family child care provider's home, you know, does accessing the space require you to use um, any, you know, types of elevator or flights of stairs and being aware of your surroundings when doing so are common spaces well lit, exits easily accessible. Um, and then thinking ahead, who else might be in a family child care provider's home during the visit? You know, it could be parents of other children, other relatives or friends, any pets, you know, including large guard dogs that might pose a risk. Um, obviously, you know, they probably have rules in place related to them not being in the, the child care area, but just being aware of, of your surroundings when you're getting out in neighborhoods um, at family child care providers for loose animals and things like that. And then just thinking about, too, whether or not what you are going out to engage in in the field, whether it, it may be that it's a more high risk activity than a normal monitoring visit. You know, are you going out to issue a cease and desist or are you going out to in investigate a sensitive allegation? Those things alone can kind of increase your risk. And so you just kind of want to be prepared ahead for those types of things. And then. And just the assessment of worker vulnerability too. you know, are you going into an area where you're going to be, you know, working alone? And if it is an area where it's a certain time of day, is it best to maybe buddy up and send, you know, two licensors together for an investigation, you know, um, later in the, you know, evening hours and different things like that. And then also um, making sure that, you know, as you get more comfortable with your caseloads in your area, that you just don't become, you know, um, over, you know, confident or, or let your guard down about, um, you know, your safety, your own personal safety. Always kind of keep that, you know, at the forefront of your mind and making sure you have a, a, a safety plan. And then finally, just the assessment of any condition of emergency equipment that may be needed. Most of you are probably traveling in your personal vehicles to locations, and so making sure that your vehicle's in good repair and working condition and you don't um, have any, you know, dangers or safety issues there. Again, making sure you have a mobile device that's fully charged and emergency numbers are available. And so... Um, just curious, any other thoughts? That's a lot of information all at once, but any other thoughts on other things that your agency would maybe consider from a physical safety perspective that you could help do to promote? I, could, I see there for Indiana, you're, you strongly encourage your staff to keep their online calendars up to date so that you know where they're going to be. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And then using the buddy system for any... Um, potentially difficult visits. Good. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and move ahead. Um, this is just some information. We're going to kind of lean in to um, see a couple of comments, additional comments too coming in about uh, police escorts and buddy systems, rental cars if needed. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about how physical safety as well as emotional um, risks. The What you see here is a adapted um, diagram from um, a framework that was developed for dealing with violence related trauma in the workplace. And so it combines stress prevention and resiliency training. It's called five essential elements of immediate and midterm trauma interventions. And we're not going to go into a lot of like trauma-informed care, but 
it, it outlines five actionable steps that help workers rebound from a traumatic, you know, a potentially traumatic workplace event. And they're really outlined by the steps that you see there on the slide there in the cycle graphic. And um, this is a good um, reminder to just, you know, it's kind of a good segue between physical safety and, and then emotional safety as well. But you'll see there at the very top, um, the darker green, it promotes safety. And one thing to bear in mind is that as our perception of safety increases, our stress reactions decrease. So there's a very real correlation between, you know, um, potential physical threats and our, our internal reactions to that. And Erica will talk a lot about that in a little bit. But then also making sure that you have within that promoting safety, having useful steps, you know, having a timely and open communication plan with all staff, updating safety training and policies and providing effective mental health services are all kind of part of that promoting promotion of safety. The next part of the cycle talks about promoting connectedness. And that's really just social support activities that include knowledge sharing, mutual problem solving and sharing of experiences. And so it's very helpful that if, you know, you have a staff that has experienced um, a, a safety issue in the field, that you have time for them to be able to share that with their colleagues and kind of work through that and talk about that so that they can um, work through that themselves, but also give information to the other staff to hopefully avoid that. And then the next step talks about pr promoting calming. And so just having an uh, opportunity to make sure that the um, worker can take care of themselves, gets, you know, can complete self-care activities. Um, and then promoting self-efficacy is next. And that's just resources such as training strategies and, and peer support who can empower individuals that have experienced, you know, an incident of, um, you know, workplace, a workplace safety issue. And then finally, the last um, circle in the cycle talks about promoting hope. And what it points out is that evidence shows that the more that individuals are able to retain hope after a traumatic event, the more likely they are to have a positive and a quicker recovery. And so that, you know, thinking about this cycle and these elements is just a good segue to kind of think about what we started off talking about, which is our physical safety and kind of blending that into more about our psychological or our emotional safety. So now with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Erica for our next segment. All right. So in this section, we are going to talk about stress, stressors, and the stress cycle. And so going on to the next slide... Um, I want to just throw out to you, what is stress? What is your definition of stress? And you can just put that in the chat and see what you uh, think stress is. Stress is overwhelmed. Absolutely. Unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Anxious. Unplanned issues beyond your control micromanaging, worrying over something you have no control. I see lots of worry and anxiety. And when I think about just, uh, what is it, this past, not even a decade, uh, I think we've just been presented with significant challenges, which has impacted the global uh, workforce. And so not from our just typical stressors, but also from just navigating new ways to work amid uh, the pandemic. But there are three types of stress. So youth stress, distress, and chronic stress. And the first one looks at uh, kind of like a positive stress response. So it involves optimal levels of stimulation. It's a type of stress that results from challenging but attainable and enjoyable or worthwhile tasks. So an example might be us presenting today <laughs> that could just give us a little bit of uh, butterflies and a little bit of stress just in preparing for that participating in an athletic event, giving a speech. And so this type of stress, it actually has a beneficial effect by generating a sense of fulfillment or achievement and facilitating growth, development, mastery, and high levels of performance. Now, distress, that's the negative stress response. It often involves uh, a negative effect and physiological reactivity. It's a type of stress that results from being overwhelmed by demands, 
losses or or perceived threats. And um, you guys captured it 100% in the chat. I've seen a lot of uh, just great examples that talk about the negative stress. And so distress triggers physiological changes that can pose serious health risks, especially if it's combined with maladaptive ways of coping. And now chronic stress, that's the physiological or psychological response to a prolonged internal or external stressful event. And so the stressor needs not remain physically present to have all of the effects, but recollections of it can substitute for its presence and therefore sustain the chronic stress. And so we're going to go on to the next slide and look at what are stressors. So does anyone have an idea what stressors are? Triggers, something that activates you for sure. Any others? Things that make you feel stress, outside stimulus, deadlines, work, home life that balance absolutely fears. Absolutely. So a stressor is any event, force, or condition that results in physical or emotional stress. They may be internal or external forces that require adjustment or coping strategies on the part of the affected individual. So the stressor need not remain physically present to have its effect. Again, recollections of it can substitute for its presence and sustain chronic stress. And just um, if you're curious where we got these definitions from, they are all from the American uh, Psychological Association. All right, so we're going to go on to the next slide and talk about um, some licensing stressors. And so the next slide asks, what are signs that others are stressed? And so we'll go on to the next slide and we'll do a quick poll. Oops. Bear with me for just oh, a okay. moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're That's getting okay. I think it is. Here we go. I'm going to launch the poll now. And again, okay. y'all, if you don't see it, it may be just that you are um, running an older version of Zoom. So not to worry. You can certainly respond to this question in the chat. Uh, but the the poll should be launched. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got some answers coming in. I'm going to give it a minute because the numbers are climbing quickly. Then we'll end it and hopefully we'll all be able to see the responses. It looks like some folks are responding in the chat, so that is great. Yeah. Uh, change of supervisor, uh, poor hygiene, grooming. That would certainly cause me stress. <laughs> yeah. The numbers are slart to slow down, so I'm going to end the poll. Okay. And share the results. Can you all see the shared results? Eric, are you all able to see it? No. No, all I see is a um, a blue line. It says, "What are some of the licensing stressors?" And okay. it's just a blue line because it's shared on this end, but it's not for some reason sharing. So sorry about that. We may have to we may have to rely on our chat, which we're doing really great at. <laughs> yes. So we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go to the next slide. And as you'll see, so many of your responses were captured here, and we just have a list of what are some of the factors that can contribute to stress. And many of you have indicated high caseload, low wages, limited resources, uh, stressful or hostile work environment, increased child care provider needs, funding, limited staff, secondary trauma, tight deadlines, lack of PD and technical assistance, Difficult conversations, engaging in them and leading them, avoiding difficult conversations, taking on child care providers' problems. And another one that's related to that is the inability to detach from child care providers' needs. 
having emotionally charged conversations. A lot of these are uh, related to communication. Ongoing regulatory changes, trying to keep up with the changes, fear for personal health and safety, and sometimes, unfortunately, even social media harassment. And I see some others that didn't make the list, and um, we definitely uh, will update that to add it. Technology issues, for sure. That's a good one. Absolutely, vacancy that goes to the adequate inadequate staffing. Yeah. All right, and so we'll go to the next slide. And so, and thank you so much for the engagement. Um, and if you could put in the chat again, what are the signs that you're stressed? Low energy, exhausted, shutting down, irritability, moodiness short-tempered, inability to focus, increased eating. Seen headaches a lot come and pop. Mm -hmm. Inability to focus, disengagement, procrastination, anxiety, getting sick, crying. Absolutely. And so now I want you to think about how do you know when others are stressed? What are those signs? So you shared when you're stressed, what does it look like when others are stressed? And they're similar, detachment, distant, moody, withdrawn, irritability, impatient, absolutely, snappy, mm -hmm. cranky, bad choices, negative body language, Absolutely, these are all signs that we're stressed. And what's interesting, which I think is not talked about a lot or enough, is that stress affects all systems of the body. So when you think about all the systems in our body, uh, musculoskeletal, respiratory, cardiovascular, endocrine, gastrointestinal, your nervous and reproductive systems, they imp stress impacts all of those systems. And so just a couple examples with the uh musculoskeletal system try saying that fast three times <laughs> uh when your body's stressed the muscles tense up and so your tent your muscle tension is almost a reflex and a reaction to the stress and it's the body's way of guarding against injury and pain with sudden onset stress the muscles tense up all at once and then release their tension when the stress passes when we think about the respiratory system uh stress and strong emotions can present uh, respiratory problems such as shortness of breath and rapid breathing. What happens is the airway between the nose and the lungs constricts. So for people with respiratory disease, this is generally uh, not a problem as the body can manage the additional work to breathe comfortably, but psycho the psychological stressors can exacer exacerbate breathing problems for people with pre-existing respiratory diseases such as asthma, uh, chronic bron bronchitis, emphysema. Also, when we think about our cardiovascular system, so our heart and blood vessels comprise the two elements of the cardiovascular system that work together in providing nourishment and oxygen to the organs of the body. So the activity of these two elements is also coordinated in the body's response to stress. So acute stress, which is stress that is momentary or short-term, such as meeting de deadlines, uh, being stuck in traffic, or suddenly slamming on the brakes to avoid an accident. This causes an increase in our heart rate, and then we have stronger contractions of the heart muscle. And with the stress hormones, um, adrenaline, cortisol, they act as messengers for these effects. And I'll give one more example of how stress impacts the system, uh, gastrointestinal. And so the gut has hundreds of millions of neurons which can function fairly independently and are in constant communication with the brain. And this explains the ability to feel the butterflies in the stomach. So stress can affect the brain-gut communication and may trigger pain, bloating, or other gut discomfort to be felt more easily. The gut is also inhabited by millions of bacteria which can influence its health and the brain's health, which can impact the ability to think and affect emotions. 
So stress is associated with changes in gut bacteria, which in turn can influence our mood. All right, and so we'll go to the uh, next slide. And so now we're gonna look at workplace burnout. And some of the uh, factors, when you know you're uh, experiencing workplace burnout, they're listed here. And we have exhaustion or feeling overwhelmed. And a lot of them you've actually put in the chat. Uh, physical symptoms such as chronic headache or fatigue, anger or irritability, distancing yourself, nervousness, um, low motivation, sadness, difficulty uh, concentrating. And what's important is that we recognize that burnout system symptoms, excuse me, is a critical first step towards managing burnout in the workplace. Work burnout signs, they fall into three main categories, exhaustion, mental distance, or cynicism about work and reduced professional efficacy. So essentially feeling unable to make the desired impact. So what we wanna do is look out for these signs of burnout as they can have severe consequences um, for employers and employees. All right, and the next slide. And so how many are familiar with what we have here, which is called the stress cycle? And I'm not sure if you know, but the stress cycle, there are actually three phases. And one of the most important things to know about the stress cycle is if you don't complete the cycle and get to that resolution part, you will stay in the stress cycle. And so I'm gonna go through each of the uh, three different phases. So the first one is the trigger stage where you actually get activated. And so this is when your body recognizes that a danger, that there's a danger in your environment. And what is important is, is if it's a perceived threat to you, you're going to get triggered. And so those others around us may not see it as a threat, but if you see it as a threat, you are going to be triggered. And what we run into nowadays is that our brains don't distinguish between psychological and physical threats. We have a ton of things that our brains perceive as threats. So it's true that the stress cycle gets triggered a lot. And so the next phase is the response phase. And this is when your body act activates your sympathetic nervous system. And so you may hear a lot um, about the fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so what happens is your adrenaline spikes, your heart rate might start racing, you might have sweaty palms, clenched jaws or fists. And what's helpful is to take inventory of how your body responds to being triggered. This awareness is helpful for knowing when the stress cycle has been triggered. And the resolution stage is really important. It's when your body goes from activating the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system. And so the system tells your body to calm down and acknowledges that you're safe. And this is the stage that most of our stress cycles actually skip. So we really need to be more intentional about triggering it. And just to go back to two words um, that you might not be uh, as familiar with, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So the sympathetic system, that one controls the flight or fight response. And so in other words, this system Pre prepares the body for strenuous physical activity. And the parasympathetic system, it regulates, so rest and digest functions. Both of the systems have opposite roles. So while your sympathetic nervous system carries signals that put your body system on alert, your parasympathetic carries signals that relaxes those systems. So the two work together to keep your body in balance. Um, Again, I have to point out that it's important to go through all three stages to get out of it. And an example that I will use a lot is say you left a work environment because it was very stressful. Well, you could go to a more laid back, not so stressful work environment, but you could still be within the stress cycle. And so while it's not possible to eliminate all stress, there are ways to reduce the risk factors for burnout and better support, support our mental health. So what we're gonna do now is uh, look at some strategies to mitigate stress and better support our mental health. 
We can go ahead and move on to the next slide and then right on to the next as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so one thing to think about is your circle of control. And we're going to kind of just briefly go through these um, for time's sake. But it's really important to be mindful and recognize where your circle of control exists um, within our lives. And so on a typical day, just think about briefly what things you are in control of. Um, you're typically in control of your own reactions. You're in control of being able to choose to think before you speak. Um, you're in control of your listening and being in the moment, taking care of your own responsibilities, being kind and responsive to others. And you're in control of your body, your words, and your thoughts. And then when you compare that and think about things that you are out of your control, such as the weather or what other people like or don't like, and their, their um, you know, actions and reactions, um, you're not in control of the past. You're not in control of other people's emotions or words. So just being mindful of your circle control can significantly reduce your stress. And the more you focus on what you can control, then the less you will focus on the things that are out of your control. And so we're going to go ahead and take a look at this next. And we're going to just, uh, for time's sake, too, I think we're, we're all doing well in the chat. We'll stick with the chat and just think about for a moment, how do you resolve stress from your licensing work? Somebody said go to Disneyland. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Walking. Yeah. Working out. Seen a lot of working out, venting, breathing, sleep, relaxing, time off, baking, horseback riding, listening to music, deep breathing. Great. Time with other people. Good. Okay. Wonderful. I think Erica, um, I'll go ahead. We can go ahead. A lot of, lot of good. Glad to see the different things that everybody's putting in. Um, it's important to make sure you um, proactively, you know, take time to resolve that stress. If we're thinking, um, ASAP, if you don't mind moving ahead to the next slide, um, one of the things to think about is, you know, with the, the scope of, of licensing work, you may be in the field and have a trigger or a stressor hit you when you are in the midst of a um, an on-site inspection or a monitoring visit. And many times um, as, Erica mentioned with our physiological responses, sometimes our immediate response is very visceral. And sometimes our instincts kick in before our, you know, kind of our minds can catch up. So it's ref reflexive, kind of a, uh, a big reflex. And so we want to think about, you know, next time you have kind of that gut reaction, that's your body's way of saying, you know, pay attention, you know, if there's a perceived threat um, and thinking about what you can really do in the moment. So Let's take the scenario that you are. You're in the middle of an annual licensing inspection for a large program. What are some of the options that are open to you? Feel free to just, you know, jot some, jot some that come to mind in the chat. Maybe you've experienced this where you've had to, um, you know, yep, step outside, Amy, right? Step away, kind of some deep breathing techniques. See that? Take a break. Exactly. Oh, Robin, that was my go-to. That, you know, if I was halfway in and I was inside, that was my cue that I needed to go outside to inspect the playground because that way I could get out and get some fresh air and, um, you know, kind of take a moment. So, yeah, certainly excuse yourself and take a time out. You may need to contact a manager or a colleague for support. Um, I, I noticed that a couple of people mentioned that either calling a supervisor or calling a coworker. Um, you know, again, just stepping outside, getting a breath of fresh air. Um, I think somebody else mentioned one of the things we had put dotted down, um, returning your, you know, to your car and getting a drink of water, you know, just bear in mind, you know, of course that, you know, these are suggestions and what everybody's including is what, what works for them. However, if your agency has particular protocols or policies related to um, what you should and should not do in these instances, obviously you want to be sure to abide by them. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to um, Erica to just talk a little bit about different ways we can resolve the stress cycle. And so if we could go to the next slide. 
And so, again, a lot of what you shared in the chat, um, we actually have it here. We just compiled a list of some strategies that can actually help you resolve the stress cycle. And again, I saw lots of deep breathing, um, journaling, dancing, reading, taking a break, doodling, uh, spending time with pets, spending time in nature, spending time with loved ones, um, painting, massage, clay art. And so we're going to go to the next slide. And what we're going to do now is focus and describe some of the strategies a little bit more in detail. Um, there was some intentionality in the ones that we're going to go into detail about. And some of the things that we thought about was access and um, how there can sometimes be barriers to actually just going for traditional um, therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy, for example. And so what we came up with were some strategies that are accessible and affordable and have proven positive um, benefits. So the first one is journaling. And there are a couple of journaling examples. Um, I'll just, again, in the interest of time, just go through a couple. And so we'll start with the gratitude, gratitude journaling. Now, this is a powerful activity. It helps you pick up and carry your focus to things that are indeed good in your life. I think sometimes we can um, hone in and laser focus on the negative and the things that are stressing us. But if we take you know, that lens out just a little bit and actually look at our, our lives, there are so many things that are um, good and positive. And so with gratitude, uh, our eyes just get bigger. And again, it's nice to just focus on the great things. Affirmation journaling is also a great one. It's helpful when you want to improve your self-talk or you're trying to manifest or achieve a goal in your life. And the basis of the affirmation practice is that it works against the negative statements in our minds. And when we think about it, affirmations are usually used in the context of um, being positive, but affirmations are actually both positive and negative. And so a very simple example is, I can do it. That's a positive one, but I can't do it. That's a negative affirmation. So just think about all the positive um, affirmations that you can uh, reflect on and um, make that a part of your daily routine. Another one is expressive journaling, which is one of my favorites. And um, I'll also talk a little bit about expressive writing later on. But expressive uh, journaling helps you talk about your feelings and thoughts, about profound experiences in your life. And you can write about a situation in life that might be causing you stress, stress or anxiety and let your emotions guide your writing. And what happens is you end up processing your emotions by getting it down on paper. And we would encourage you to write until you feel a sense of release or catharsis. And so we'll go to the next one. Oh, next slide. Okay, and so here are some um, journal prompts. And some are, you can list five things that you're grateful for about your mental health. And again, that goes back to the gratitude journaling. Another one is write three affirmations that remind you to prioritize your self-care and well-being. And again, that's the affirmation journaling. Another one is write about a new experience or activity and how it made you feel. And another one that um, I really like is to write a hundred word story about a childhood memory. And so these are some ideas that um, you can give or try. Now, something else that, again, is um, accessible and affordable is meditation. And there are different types of meditation. Again, in the interest of time, I will just focus on a few. And so the first one I'll talk about is loving kindness meditation. This type is also known as meta meditation. And the goal is to cultivate an attitude of love and kindness toward everything. So you breathe deeply. And when you're breathing in deeply, you open your mind to receive loving kindness. And then you can send messages of loving kindness to the world, specific people or loved ones. And in most forms of this meditation, the key is to repeat the message many times until you feel an attitude of benevolence. 
the next one we are going to uh, look at is breath awareness meditation. And this is a type of mindful meditation that encourages mindful breathing. Practitioners breathe slowly and deeply, counting their breaths. And the goal is to focus only on breathing and ignore other thoughts that enter the mind. And as a form of mindfulness uh, meditation, breath awareness offers many of the same benefits as mindfulness, which include reduced anxiety, improved comfort, concentration, and increased uh, emotional flexibility. Uh, I'll skip to the last one, which is guided meditation. And this is the voice of either a live person or a taped recording, which can act as a guide in directing various types of meditation. This differs from forms of self-guided meditation that is an, it's an individual's own mind, we would direct that one. So someone may use guided meditation for mindfulness. People who are new to this meditation may wish to start with a guide uh, in some form. A live guide may be available in group settings while a recording is available via videos, uh, podcasts, apps, and audio uh, recordings. All right, and we'll go to the next one. Um, so what I also wanted to share, I talked about um, expressive writing. So an activity that I wanna share is actually um, ekphrastic poetry. So we'll go to the next slide. And I'm just reading the comments as well. The four count breathing is so helpful and can be done everywhere. Absolutely. And Shelby, I, this is great. You think that this would be a good session uh, for the seminar? Absolutely. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is to take a look at this picture and I want you to write or well, type in the chat, what words come to mind when you take a look at this picture? What feelings might come up? Peace, peace. Lots of peace, relaxation, joy, freedom, calm. I love it. And so ekphrastic poetry is when you write a poem that is based off of a picture or a photo. And so when we think about poetry, um, you know, there's different forms, haiku, rhyming, but ekphrastic poetry, there's no form, there's no specific stanzas. You are truly just engaging with the photo and writing down or typing in the chat um, what it makes you feel and just what words come to mind. And I love talking about the uh, something that's called the expressive writing paradigm. And it's by uh, a psychologist, his name is Penny Baker. And what he did was he did some research experiments where he divided people into two groups and he asked some to write about emotionally significant experiences. And then he had the others, the other group write about common things. So it could have been their shoes or maybe the cars that were passing on the street. Both of the groups wrote for the same span of time, about 20 minutes a day for three days in a row. And in Penny Baker's experiments, some participants, they wrote about um, abuse by a once trusted family member. Some wrote about catastrophic failures. Others wrote about devastating losses of their deepest relationships, their breakups, um, illnesses, death. And in each study, Penny Baker found that the people who wrote about emotionally charged episodes experienced marked improvement in their physical and in their mental well being. They were happier, less depressed, less anxious. And in fact, in the months after uh, their writing session, they reported having lower blood pressure, immune, um, excuse me, improved immune function and fewer visits to the doctor. They also reported better relationships, improved memory, and more success at work. And the writers who thrived the most began to develop insight using phrases such as, I have learned, it struck me that, the reason that I now realize and I understand. So in the process of writing, they were able to create the distance between the thinker and the thought, the feeler and the feeling that allowed them to gain new perspective, unhook and move forward. And so thank you so much for sharing uh, the words that you um, and your feelings toward this photo. And I will actually uh, 
show you what a writer came up with. And the poem is Welcome Home, Relax, Release, Ride the Waves, Travel Deeper into Uncharted Waters, Exploring New Depths, Conquering Old, fear, old Fears, Sharing My Compass, Navigating the Way Home to Ourselves. And so that's something that I would encourage you um, to do. Um, personally, we can incorporate it into the workplace. And um, anyone have any idea who the writer of that poem is? Okay, I'll tell you, it was me. <laughs> but I do, I think this is one of my favorite forms of, um, uh, uh, sometimes I don't like to use the word therapy, but it's just one of my favorite forms to help uh, mitigate stress. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. And we're now gonna look at some communication challenges. I know when we were talking about what causes stress, communication um, came up. And so next slide. Oh, and I'm just um, reading the comments. <laughs> I wonder if anyone said adult beverages. Mm -hmm. That's funny. <laughs> I have a delayed reaction. Bear with me, guys. <laughs> okay, so what are some challenges when communicating with licensing teams? And if you could include that in the chat again. Right, so when we're communicating with licensing teams, absolutely, some people don't like change. Difference of opinions interpretations, personalities, people not listening, misinformation, age differences. That's an interesting one for sure. Sometimes supervisors aren't so accessible because they're very busy. Fear of their own vulnerability. Absolutely. And so we'll go to the next slide where we are gonna share, um, oh, yes. And so what are some challenges when communicating with um, providers? Language barriers, education, mm -hmm. same thing, they don't listen. Hostility, language, I see a lot of language. Fixed mindsets, mm -hmm. culture, attitude, cultural differences. I saw one that was interesting that they feel anxious or threatened, maybe mm -hmm. the providers. Mm -hmm. Resistance to change, lack of follow through. Mm. Negative views, their intention, unwilling to try new practices. Fear again came up, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so we're going to go to the next slide where we listed some of the contributing factors to communication challenges. And a lot of them, again, you listed in the chat. So word choice, tone of voice, use of jargon, emotions, passive learning, not very trusting, um, not being very transparent, delayed communication. Again, I saw some in the chat that had to do with change. Uh, using you statements, stressful work environments, culture and language differences, lack of empathy, interrupting. Uh, there's another one, the performative. Does anyone know what that is referring to, the performative? And so performative, that means insincere, shallow, it's essentially the opposite of genuine. And so sometimes our policies can be performative. And for example, if we think about when we go back to COVID, an example of a performative COVID policy would be, we're allowing remote work, but not providing flexibility for employees who must manage caretaking and schooling from home as well. Another one might be frontline businesses putting COVID precautions in place for workers, but not enforcing social distancing, providing personal protective equipment or conducting temperature checks. Another one might be implementing a self-care wellness, a self-care wellness program to mitigate burnout, but they're not doing anything to address unmanageable workloads. 
and the always on culture. So um, that's the performative. And so those are some of the communication challenges. And we're going to go to the next slide. And I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with the iceberg concept of culture. And Tracy is going to drop the link to be able to view this because it might not be so easy to see um, in this platform. But uh, take a look at that. And the concept of the iceberg concept of culture is there are things that are above the iceberg, which we can visibly see. So basically how I show up today, um, a black woman, glasses, these are things you can see, but what you can't see, which is below the iceberg are the beliefs, values, and a lot of these can differ between different cultures. So concept of time, how different cultures feel about um, the elderly and how they treat them, um, feelings toward adolescents and how they treat them. So there are many things that can um, differ in terms of our own lived experiences. And when we think about that, and that shows up in the workplace and we think about communication, you can see how sometimes that can cause problems. And the main characteristics of communication problems, they stem from misunderstanding what one has said or misinterpreting the meaning of their overall message. And some common communication barriers are language, cultural differences, uh, gender differences, emotional disconnect, and the use of jargon. And cultural differences have many effects on communication. And so people with different cultural backgrounds, they communicate, there's many different styles, their language, words, and phrases may differ even in their application. And again, it shapes people's attitudes in times of conflict. And so one that um, we talk about a lot is eye contact. And so eye contact is very important in some cultures, but some see that as rude and disrespectful in others if you don't make eye contact. But in some cultures, it's, it's disrespectful to look someone straight in the eye. So those are just some differences. And there's something that I came across uh, recently that talks about it's Hall's high and low context theory. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that, but the high and low context culture refers to how important contextual cues are in interpreting a message. So high context cultures have a communication style that's based on body language, tone, overall context, while low context cultures, they're more straightforward and they're more explicit in their communication. And one of the examples that I came across was um, in China, for example, and in some Asian uh, countries where they'll, they'll bow and by them bowing when they meet someone, that is sending, they're communicating with one another, even though they're not using words. And so I'll give you another example. In a high context culture, yes may mean yes. Yes may mean no. Yes may mean maybe, depending on how the yes is messaged. So it's not just the word, it's the facial expression, the tonality of the voice and the body language. Whereas in low context cultures, yes means yes and no means no. <laughs> so listening is not just, have you heard me? Listening is now, have you understood what I meant? And so when you think about communicating with um, different people from different cultures that might be low context, um, high context, if you explicitly say no, there's a good chance the person might not hear it. And the person, um, if you don't explicitly use the word no, they might not hear it. And so we have to, again, pay attention to cues. And some cultures have been described um, as beating around the bush. <laughs> so they don't understand what you're saying. Whereas in low context cultures, sometimes it's uh, misinterpreted as being rude because they're very direct. And so culture can be subjective. It's relative to your point of reference. And another uh, point that I want to add in is think about translators and <laughs> just think about translation. And so if you're in a role where you have to translate, it's important to know the role of culture in the translation and whether the language speakers are low or high context in order to ensure that the right emphasis is created in the translation. So again, these are just some um, 
things that come into play when we talk about communication. Oh, yes, can mean I hear you, but does not mean understand. Absolutely. I'm Russian. I know sometimes people assume a lot of things due to cultural differences. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great points. All right, and so we are going to go to the next slide. And so recognizing that there are um, cultural differences, and even if you take out just the cultural differences and think about all the stressors that are impacting our lives, we want to share some strategies on how we can navigate some difficult conversations. And so the next slide. So the three things that we're going to focus on is how to give better feedback, how to practice um, compassionate communication, and how to use verbal intervention skills. All right, and so the next slide. So I know as um, in the fields that we're in as licensures, we have to give feedback often. And so one of the ways that we found that you can give feedback effectively is to first ask for permission. Uh, some people may find feedback and timing difficult. So say for instance, you just came into work, you spilled your coffee and now you're inspecting um, you know, the person that spilled their coffee, their childcare, uh, you know, provider and looking at the environment and you now want to go and tell this person, um, so I found this, this and that. And the person's got the coffee stained shirt <laughs> and they're just not, they're just, they just, they just can't. It could be very difficult to receive that feedback. They're just not receptive. And so what could be helpful is just to say, hey, I have some um, feedback that I want to give you is now a good time or would you like to schedule it for X, Y, and Z? And so that's one way that is super helpful is to ask for permission. The next one is to try writing it down first. Written words are formulated with meaning. So you can consider the truthfulness of your feedback and avoid insensitive and judgmental remarks. So when you write it down, you could read it back and you could say, mm, I might wanna switch that word up. The next one is be practical and think of uh, think of it as ongoing mentorship. So to drive change, make the feedback a process. Something that's helpful is giving your own experiences on how practically you managed in a similar situation. And so set practical action items to reach. And again, you don't want to just, it's sometimes not helpful to give uh, feedback. Mm, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> You know, I don't know how many people would necessarily receive that well. And so give examples, make it practical, make it relevant. And the last one is be relevant. So provide uh, relevant insights and make sure that your feedback is related to workplace performance and relationships and share resources. And the last one I think is so important is to encourage feedback loops. You know, the first time that you give feedback it shouldn't be when you your first hire the person. Um, so this is your job. And then the next time you evaluate them is when they're on the way out the door at the exit interview. Mm -mm. We want to make sure that it's um, ongoing and that it's consistent. And I would take it one step further and not have it be one way. So as a supervisor, um, I'm giving you feedback, but you should also be prepared to get feedback from those that you're managing and the teams that you're leading. All right, and the next slide. I think as you're transitioning okay. there, Erica, I think it's really important to think about how those steps, as you mentioned at the beginning, how they can be implied, you know, with just the approaches to exit interviews when you're you're um, going over your monitoring results with providers in the field yeah. and just, you know, being sensitive to people's cues as well. Sorry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you. That's super helpful. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with something called the compassionate communication approach. It's also been referred to as nonviolent communication. And I think, unfortunately, as a society, um, sometimes the way we communicate, it's just not very compassionate. It's not filled with a lot of empathy. And a lot of the uh, feedback is, is those you statements, you are this, you are that. And again, that is going to be a perceived and an actual threat to a lot of folks. So Something that you can do is called compassionate communication. And here are the steps. The first one is you want to state the observation 
just purely factual without any judgment or evaluation. So the example would be the factual one is it's 2 a.m. and I hear your stereo playing. The, value, the evaluation part is when someone says, it's way too late to be making such an awful racket. So you see the difference? The first one, you simply went to the person and said, hey, it's, it's two o'clock and I hear your stereos playing. The second step is state the feeling that the observation is triggering in you and name the emotion without a moral judgment. And so another example is, I see your dog running around without a leash and barking. I'm scared. And so again, you are stating the observation and then you're placing how that observation is making you feel. Your dog's running around without a leash, I'm, I'm scared. So the third step is to state the need that is the cause of that feeling or guess the need that caused the feeling in the other person and ask. So an example would be, I saw that your name was mentioned I saw that your name wasn't mentioned in the acknowledgements. Are you feeling resentful because you're not getting the appreciation that you need? So it's a little bit of an assumption there, but you asked. And the response might be, no, it's not that big of a deal to me. But the response might be to someone, you know what? Thank you for bringing that up. I, I did feel some kind of way. I felt left out. And so the final part in the step is to make a concrete request for action to meet the need, just identify it. Ask clearly and specifically for what you want right now. So an example would be, hey, I noticed that you haven't spoken in the last 10 minutes. Are you feeling bored? If the answer is, yeah, actually I am. You might bring up your own feeling and propose it in action. You know what, I'm actually bored too. Would you like to go to uh, the Exploratorium? <laughs> so again, that's, um, making a concrete request for the action and asking for um, asking clearly and specifically for what you want. And so those are some examples. And what I also think isn't talked about enough too is also with boundary setting. So use a similar approach. So if you are in a conversation with someone and let's say their tone went up a little bit high, telling them, don't speak to me in that manner, lower your voice, mm, they may tell you, yeah, whatever. But the boundary would be, hey, listen, the tone in, in what you're talking is making me uncomfortable. If you continue to talk in that way, I'm going to have to exit the conversation. Um, I'll come back when you could bring it down. And so that's the difference. All right, next slide. And here are some effective verbal intervention strategies. Um, I'll go through them really quickly. I know we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so the first one is Remain calm. The second one, remove the audience. Watch your body language. Keep it simple. Use reflective questioning. Use silence and watch your paraverbals. Is everyone familiar with what paraverbals means? So paraverbal communication is the tone, volume, and rhythm of speech. And research tells us that paraverbals account for nearly 30%, 38% of what is understood and perceived by others. All right, next slide. And what we came up here are some, is a list and a set of expectations and rules that can help guide behaviors within the group and foster interactions. Um, when I'm giving trainings, I, I always share these as meeting norms. And I think it helps just set the tone and uh, is a non-threatening way <laughs> to kind of guide people in the direction of these compassionate communication approaches. So communicate honestly, compassionately, respectfully, be present, fully participate, minimize distractions. If the content is upsetting or it's activating you, take a beat, excuse yourself. Listen with an open mind. Instead of making assumptions, ask questions, take an inquiry stance. Hear all voices, uh, create space, uh, use the chat. And I think um, sometimes some folks, we're just more prone to, to talk more than others. And sometimes we may have to decenter ourselves and just make sure that we're being inclusive to others. Reflect before you respond. Attack the problem, not the person. Again, those you statements. 
start and end on time, <laughs> honor confidentiality, uphold self, mutual, and community accountability. And I think it's back to you. Uh, it Amy. is. Thanks so much, Erica. Absolutely. And we know that was a lot of information very, very quickly. I'll just point out real quick that there are a couple of things related to safety and workplace wellness in NARA best practices. And so those um, standards are there and you can refer to those. And if we move on ahead, I know we don't have a lot of time right now to answer questions, but we do have an opportunity that we are going to um have available for you all that we'll tell you about in just a minute. So if you have questions, please, please um, put them in the chat for us because we will use those as we move forward with the follow-up discussions that we're going to talk about um, in the slide deck as well. And we're going to move through them very, very quickly. There are all of the resources to the slides. So ASAF, actually, if you want to just Fast forward through those. When the slides are posted, you'll have access to all those resources. And then the opportunities that I wanted to tell you all about is starting the week after next, we are going to hold what we're referring to as three community conversations. They're going to be on March 12th, 14th, and 19th. These are taking place of our licensing communities of practice, and they are going to be specific to today's topic. So if there are a lot of questions that you have related to what you've heard or the, the excellent tips that Erica has shared, we encourage you to register for one of these. Tracy's going to drop the registration links in the chat. It's only necessary for you to register for one. They'll all be structured the same way. They are going to be limited to the first 100 participants on a first registered first, um, you know, on a first registered basis, because we're really trying to ensure that the group size is smaller and dig into some questions and kind of dig into the meat of how all of this information kind of uh, translates to the field and to the work and the, of the different roles of licensing. And so if you're interested, we'd love to have you join. Um, Tracy, you might want to drop the the uh, the chats busy, so you might want to just drop the, the links again in a moment in case anybody missed them. Um, but please do plan to join us for one of those if you're interested. And then ASAF, if we can go ahead to the next um, slide. As I mentioned in oh, one back, sorry, the kids. There we go. As I mentioned in the opening, licensing is the foundation uh, for the early ed child childhood system in many aspects. And so we just wanted to take a brief moment to celebrate all of you for the true superheroes that you are on a daily basis for children, families, and providers. Um, we know that licensing is a very demanding job and oftentimes it can feel somewhat isolating and even thankless. So we wanted you to just know how much you are really appreciated and whether your role is behind the scenes at the state office, if it's managing a group of licensors, or if you're one of our frontline licensing staff out there in the field, we just want you to know that the work you do on a daily basis is vital and it's important and it matters. And we salute you and we thank you for all that you do. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to share with you a quote that ties into today's topic. It says, taking care of yourself is the most powerful way to begin to take care of others. And so it's from um, Bryant McGill, who's an author. He's described as a human potential thought leader. But just remind yourself of that quote when it's time, you know, to take a moment to recharge um, so that you can provide your best self back to this critical work. So thank you all again for all that you do. Um, as we close out here in a minute, um, we are going to have a automated um, evaluation pop up. It's a very short four question survey monkey, and we really want to hear from you about today's session and also about what other licensing topics you'd like to hear more about. So we appreciate it greatly if you'll take a few moments to respond to those few questions. And then the next slide just shows our center contact information. Reminder, you'll get a certificate based on registration from the live session today. That will take probably a couple of weeks before that goes out when we can verify all the attendance. So be on the lookout for that via email. And today's session is going to be recorded in the slide deck posted to our website as well. So with that, we would just want to thanks again to everybody for joining us today. Special thanks to Erica for the fantastic information, as well as ASAF and Tracy for their support. And we hope to see you at the upcoming community conversations. Have a wonderful rest of your day and take good, take good care and be well. Thanks so much.
Take care, everybody. Thank you.